In the 50s, her face was on the cover of Time magazine. The men in her life were famous, her records were hits, and life was just flying high. And then life took kind of a downward curve. But today, she's flying straight as an arrow and real steady. Let's welcome Rosemary Clooney. Thank you. Thank you. It's Hello. great to have you here today. It really is great. And I guess that we here in Detroit always feel a special kind of a feeling about somebody whose background or whose roots are from Detroit. You got started in the, the era of the big bands. I and did, yeah. Yes. Tell us a little bit about what that was like. Uh, my sister and I started with Tony Pastor's band. We had been working at, uh, at WLW in Cincinnati. I was born in Kentucky and lived in Cincinnati most of my life. Um, uh, well, most of my life before I was 16. And then uh, we started in radio at WLW, and we had uh, a couple of wonderful years learning how to sing and uh, how to do different kinds of shows. It was great training. And then Tony Pastor came through town and hired us, and for the first time we went out of Ohio and Kentucky and Indiana, and uh, our first job was in, uh, uh, in at the Steel Pier, and that was a wonderful place to, for bands to play, and there was a great horse that jumped off the back of the pier, you know, with the lady on top of his back. It was really <laughs> exciting. Uh, we, we traveled with Tony for about three years, and it was, uh, it was great fun. Really? Was it being in the right place at the right time? Was it luck? I mean, was it hard oh, sure. work that gets that big break? Well, well I, think, I think hard work has a great deal to do with it, Sonia, simply because you have to be ready, you know, when, when something does happen. Um, but certainly being in the right place at the right time. And it was a series of, uh, of circumstances that I didn't foresee at all. I was always happy doing what I happened to be doing at the time. My sister had great ambition, though and had uh, enough spark for both of us to get started at least. Oh, that's great. And yeah. then, of course, it was onto the Hollywood circuit, and you, you yeah. met and then married uh, Jose Farrar. Yes. Yeah. Sixteen years your senior, I think, at that particular yes. time. Yes, and even as we speak. And <laughs> even, even now, yes. 16 even years, now, sixteen years, you're a senior. Yes. <laughs> yes. You had quite an adventure with him. Yes, yes. yes. What, was there something special about that, that seniority that had some appeal, do you think? Oh, I think certainly. And I think... Uh, I think he was quite different from anyone that I had ever known in my life. I was born in the Midwest, and uh, and I don't know, there was a kind of a glamour about a man that had a, a great education and spoke seven languages and was one of the greatest actors in, of our country, I believe. Now, what do you do when you're in a rising career and you take on married life? Well, uh, you approach it with great hope, uh, some trepidation, I'm, I'm remember quite well. Um, pretend that everything's going fine, like of course you can run the big house and have the, the great parties and all of that and not know really what you're talking about when you, when you do that, get a lot of advice from friends. Um, the big adjustment uh, came, I think, when I had uh, five children in five years, really. I had my, first, my first son was born in uh, February of 1955 and my fifth child in March of 1960, so, so uh, yeah, it was... I'll bet. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it was like having quince. My closest friend was the diaper man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it was that and two television series and more hit records. What were you, Superwoman? I thought so. I thought so. And actually, that was the 50s myth, wasn't it? Yeah, well, you don't know. True. That's yes, too young. Oh, yes, no. I do. <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was, because in the 1950s, everybody picked up the same magazines that I read, you know, and everybody said that you could do everything that you right. could have a perfect home and a perfect career and perfect children and uh, of course that isn't quite factual well what do you do then I mean are you pulled between children and a career are you pulled between children husband a career and self what what started to happen to you I think probably the latter um, all the uh, all the things pull you at one time or another um, the thing that I didn't realize is that you could wake up every morning and decide what the priorities were for that day I didn't understand that, so that I thought everything was moved first. And so to try to give total concentration to any one of the four, you know, I mean, all four at the same time was difficult. You and Jose were um, married not once, but twice. Yes. There was a period yes. of a, a reconciliation, and then... Yes. Actually, why, we weren't... Why we, couldn't you stay together? I mean, can you why speak couldn't to we? that? Yeah. Um, there was so much going for the two of you. Yes. Uh, Except it's strange, because when we got married, 
everyone said, what on earth do they have in common? So it's all according to your frame of reference, really. But you told me what you had. Yes. There was a superior yes. human being yes. you saw Yes. Him. But and that's not children. what we had in common, is it? Well, but really. there were the children. And yes, indeed. Family, that's that's the main thing. Friends. Uh, it, was, uh, it was quite difficult. His career took him in one direction, mine in another. Um, he really wanted to live in New York, I believe, because eventually that's where he ended up. You know, it's so important that you make that point as we speak, because sometimes we don't even stop and think that there are some wonderful things going for us, and they can even take us in even more separate directions than at the moment that we started. Down. Yes, it's yeah. true. It's true. Quite true. Of marriage. But things started to change for you, too, and apparently yes, not I in think. a very happy direction. Yes. I think a lot of it was chemically induced. I had started taking a lot of pills, different kinds of pills. That was also something that was very big in the 50s. In fact, you know, I, I was reading some, uh, some old scripts that, uh, that I did, some shows with Bing and shows with Bob Hope, and there were big jokes about Milltown, and, uh, and they weren't really Milltown, jokes. Milltown, that's right. Sure. That's right. It wasn't really a joke. Is that something that one does on the road? I mean, is it part of trying to stay up for a show and then come down and go to sleep? Is that the I cycle? Didn't, I, I didn't have, I didn't take uppers. That wasn't my, my thing. I had, uh, I liked uh, uh, tranquilizers <laughs> and I loved sleeping pills and uh, sometimes something Why? called Percodan. Why? Why? Yeah, I hear I think, Percodan I, all the time. Yeah. People are still doing a lot. Yeah. Of well, I think Percodan is, is one of the most addictive drugs that is known. Isn't that but, true? Yeah, but what did you like? I mean, what is it that that was giving you that this great life was? Well, uh, it removes you from the life, obviously, that is not so great. So a lot of what we see is all the outside stuff, the it's veneer. the same stuff that the, I was reading, too. You yeah, know. the same stuff you were reading. Sure. Was there ever a moment for you, a moment where you made a decision as to whether or not you were going to go on and, and live, whether it was a moment or or you were going to move in one direction or another and you said to yourself, I have to, I have to make a decision about what I'm going to do with my life. Do you mean with, the, with my illness, with my... Uh, well, life was, it was not going well. And oh, indeed. But I mean, do you mean with you my career? Well, you kind of decided to live. You decided that you were going to try to do something to make your life better? See, I think the thing that I had to do was get away from the, the chemicals because that really, really distorted any kinds of facts that I would feel or any any kind of honest, honest feeling that I would have. So in order to do that, uh, I suppose I had to go to the point that I did, which was uh, almost the end of everything. Well, there yeah. was a, a story that I know that I read that, that had to have been something that stays with you, something about being, uh, driving on a mountain road. Oh, yeah. I was, in, uh, I was in Reno, working in Reno, and I was going to Lake Tahoe. It's, it, it's a, a, a scene that was in the picture that Sandra Locke did about my life, and it was, uh, that was accurate. This thing that, the thing that would probably save me is because there's a new road that goes up to Lake Tahoe from Reno that everybody takes. I was on the old Mount Rose Highway, which is what I remembered, and so I was driving on the wrong side of the road, and uh, I made it, but I think just because a couple of angels were on my shoulder and, uh, and I had other things to do. You know, for so many of us, and as you say, we read the magazines, and that seems to be all that we pay attention to. There is so much that we don't see. When we continue, let's talk a little bit about life and success and the troubles and pulling it together, I okay. think, that people have to do so that we get to see the inside, what we don't often read when we pick up those glossy magazines. We'll do that when we return right after that. <laughs> Now, enjoy delicious fried food without fried food calories. Sound too good to be true? Introducing the incredible Swiss Dry Cooker. A simple, powerful design gives you crisp, deep-fried goodness with just a drop of oil. It seems like an ordinary pan, but look, the secret of the dry cooker is this patented hot air tower. Superheated air rushes up, circulates around food, cooking quickly, evenly. Dry cooking actually bastes food not in fattening grease, but in their own rich flavors and aromas. Yes, more flavor than you've ever tasted before with less oil, fewer calories, less cholesterol. Watch, deep fried chicken cooks because it's surrounded by boiling oil. This batch actually soaked up this much oil. Put chicken in the dry cooker and it's surrounded only by naturally flavored superheated air. 
with only a drop of oil, turn out crispy, perfect frozen French fries and fish sticks. Bake a cake in a fry pan? Never. But watch, the cooker is so dry, you can actually bake on the stovetop. Superheated convection currents bake evenly, top and bottom. Dry cook hot dogs and they taste like they've been barbecued over a hickory fire, but that's still just the beginning. Dry cooked vegetables without boiling or steaming. Look at this amazing comparison. This broccoli was boiled, this done in the dry cooker, bursting with colors and vitamins. Baked potatoes taste like they've been roasted over a campfire. You can dry roast nuts or prepare a mouth-watering roast. The incredible Swiss dry cooker with exclusive hot air tower gives you all the flavor of crisp frying, but almost none of the fattening oils and calories. Order now on this special TV offer for just $24.95. Money back if not delighted. Use your credit card for rush delivery. Here's how to order. Credit card and COD customers call toll-free 1-800-USA-1000. In Georgia, call 1-800-222-7272. To save COD fees, send $24.95 plus $2 postage and handling to Cooker, Box 49648, Atlanta, Georgia. That's Cooker, Box 49648, Atlanta, Georgia. Starry sky. Nice work if you can get it, and you can get it if you try. Strolling with the one boy. We're talking with Rosemary Clooney. We talked a little bit about the adventure of life, the big rise, and then some of the things that started to happen because you found yourself doing what a lot of the women in the 50s, you said, to take a pill because it was easier than facing a lot of the problems, particularly if you couldn't live up to the superwoman image that a lot of us got. Now, people want to ask you some questions, so I'm going to kind of step back and, and let them do that because I know how important that sure. is for them. Yes. What happened to your sister? My sister died in 1976. It was uh, quite sudden and really out of order because she was 45. And uh, it was a cerebral hemorrhage, just very quickly. And, uh, and I miss her. Yeah. Yes. What was it like working with Bing Crosby in his movies? And what do you think of the book Gary Crosby is bringing out? I don't know anything about the book that Gary's bringing out. Gary brought over some pages that had to do with my sister because they used to go out together. And so those, those pages that I was uh, interested in and involved in, I okayed for him. And uh, that part of it was just fine. So I don't know about the rest of it. Um, a friend of mine read a review and said that it was like Daddy Dearest. I tend to wonder about that, though, because uh, in the final analysis, you know, he, Bing, was, uh, Bing was a human being. He just had a very high profile for about 50 years. And uh, that, that would be difficult for any of us, wouldn't it? Can you tell us a little bit yeah. about working with him? Because I oh, think the best. Yeah. The best. He was, uh, he was my teacher. Uh, he was the most professional man that I'd ever met in my life. You'd better know your part before you got there because he was letter perfect by the time you got to the first rehearsal. And he seemed to like a lot of children too, didn't he? He did, indeed. It's called Vatican Roulette. <laughs> <laughs> you had a question. Do you want to stay in, please? <laughs> yes. Yes. Do you babysit a lot? Oh, I do. do I do. And, and Debbie's going to have another baby in September. Do you know that? Well, tell us yes. a little bit about that. Will you, Debbie oh, and Debbie Boone? Debbie Boone Ferrer, yes. yes. Uh, married to my, uh, to my middle son, Gabrielle Ferrer, who is a wonderful artist and sculptor. And uh, one of the prides of my life, Gabrielle is. Um, they have a son <laughs> that is my first grandchild, Jordan Alexander Ferrer, and he is uh, two and a half. He'll be three in July. And... Uh, the most extraordinary child I've ever known. <laughs> Isn't that awful? Isn't that awful? I embarrass my daughter-in-law and my son. I can't help but Let me ask you something so about good. that. Debbie yes. Boone, of course, has a singing career. Yes. And you have a show business family. Yes. And you have gone through a variety of experiences yes. with a career and motherhood. And, and uh, Gabrielle has his own career. Did you ever sit her on your knee, so to speak, and say, uh, Debbie, there are a couple of things I think you ought to be aware of getting yourself into this, and may I give you some of my experience? I mean, did you ever do that? Yes, but it didn't quite happen that way, Sonia. I wouldn't presume to do that. Uh, she comes from a family that is, is wonderfully instructive and correct in their, in their rearing of their children. Um, I feel, though, that when Debbie comes to me to ask me something in particular, because we do have something very much in common, aside from my son and hers. Um, 
and that is the fact that we have a family and we and we work debbie has done a wonderful thing though she sometimes with a, with a very uh, uh, successful career which debbie has she's a wonderful singer and has had tremendous success the machine gets bigger than the than the career the thing that is in back of it with agents and lawyers and uh, and personal managers and accountants and secretaries and so many people that depend upon you and the career to keep moving she really stepped back from that and uh, disassembled the machine and said when i work it will be on a smaller level and that's very smart very smart yeah, for, age for any of us who might have daughters or, or friends with this two-career yeah. situation, what, what might you say to Debbie? I mean, if, if you were going to have kind of a heart-to-heart, -heart, that would be one caution, not a warning, but just be careful about the kind of thing that happens with two people who have wonderful artistic careers. I can't even put myself in that situation. Isn't that funny? Because she really, she really does everything in a, in a correct way. She really does everything okay. right. Okay. She really so, does it. You had a question. You said that you started off with big band. Did you study any other kind of music, you know, when you were little, like 16 and so on, to about 21? <laughs> little at no. 16? This was a woman. <laughs> uh, no, I, I understand what you mean, and I think it's a wonderful thing to do and important to do. Um, I didn't. I didn't learn how to read music, for instance. And very often I've been in a total panic trying to memorize a song, and because that's the only way that I can learn it. I have to memorize it. As a result of that, though, I've gotten, I got to be rather quick in memorizing. So uh, it's either that or, you know, die along the way. <laughs> but it, it should be done. I think that uh, it's important to study. Yes. Rosemary, yes. besides the seeing you in your neat commercials every day, I hear you're breaking records in England with a real hot jazz album. Is that true? It isn't in England, actually. It's in Japan. Japan. Isn't oh, it really? amazing? <gasps> yeah. I'm, I'm so yeah. glad. Thank you. Thank you. I went to Japan to pick up a gold record. It's been a long time in between gold records, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, maybe, isn't it? There was a, there was a wonderful quote from a, from a man who was doing an interview with the uh, Sashi Press, which has seven million readers in Tokyo. And he was talking to me and he said, what do you think the, the reason for the success of these jazz albums is? And I said, well, I suppose a lot of it is nostalgia because, you know, after all, I've been around for a while, and my records sold in Japan before. And he said, no, madame, the people that are buying your records now didn't know you then. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Which I liked a Let's lot. Let's talk a little bit. <laughs> Let's talk about the comeback. That, that couldn't have been easy. No, it wasn't. How do you go about even starting? Well, I tell you what I think helped a lot, Sonia, and that was the fact that uh, there, was, there was an article about uh, my breakdown and the things that caused it, and... Uh, and then a book about it. And I think that that helped tremendously because there was a lot of speculation on what was the matter. Whether I had a problem with pills, which was indeed true, and, or booze, which was not true. Uh, a lot of speculation. So in order just to get the record straight, I think that was the important start. After that, I had to kind of prove myself all over again. It's very hard that way. What about your fans? Can you count on them to carry oh, you? Oh, you betcha. So they're there. And yeah. They're loyal. Oh, yeah. What about Four Girls Four? Oh, was that's that, fine. Was that kind of the coming out of catharsis in, in many ways? In, in many ways. Uh, the thing that really changed it for me, though, the, in, a, in a kind of a national and international way, was Bing. Because he asked me to do the shows that he started doing, and he had never done personal appearances before. So this was a joy for me and such a tremendous success because he... Well, people, I think, just went through life never thinking that they would see Bing Crosby in person, and here they had a chance to do it, and it was just thrilling to be a part of it. Well, tell us a little bit. Give us a story of what that must have been like. Like Bing? Bad. Yeah. The two of you okay. doing some things. Well, he used to hide his scotch bottle from me in the back of the television set. <laughs> I don't know why that came to me, but it was really, it's really true. He used to do that. Then, then I, he borrowed my Vic Sav all the time, never brought it back. Um, <laughs> He's, he's, uh, he's so comfortable on the stage that it's just wonderful to see. We were at the Palladium. And instead of, at the, the Palladium shows usually uh, work so that you have, uh, the first half will be a lot of opening acts, and then the, the star comes out in the second half. Well, Bing didn't want to do it that way. He had 40 musicians on the stage, and the curtains would open, and they'd play when the blue of the night meets the gold of the day, and he'd walk on the stage. Well, those people would stand on their seats and just 
and just applaud. And uh, were you real scared? No. You were No. No, the first time, the first time probably, the first night at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, I was terrified. I had new material, and I was holding the material, you know, the songs like this and reading them and trying to memorize. At that late date, it was a little late to start, but I, I had started early. Anyway, anyway, I, uh, I was doing that, and he said, why are you so scared? And I said, I, I just am. And he said, well, uh, they're not going to form a posse and come up and get you, so <laughs> relax a little bit. He was that way, though. He felt That's very, great. very comfortable with people. That's great. When we continue, let's talk about Rosemary today. Okay. Okay, and we'll do that right after this. <laughs> You mean it works better than this? Absolutely. Clorox pre-wash cleans circles around the leading trigger pre-wash on tough grease stains. Prove it on my son's pants. That's weak old grease. I'll circle both stains. With ballpoint ink? Yes, their trigger pre-wash here, Clorox pre-wash here, then wash. Well... Their spot's still there. Clorox pre-wash even worked on that ink circle. It does work better. Clorox pre-wash cleans circles around the leading trigger pre-wash. You use sandpaper to clean your bathtub? Ridiculous. Yet, if you're cleaning with scouring powder, you're probably using the same harsh, scratchy abrasives found in this sandpaper, and that can be rough on your tub. That's why soft scrub is better. It's a liquid cleanser that cleans like a scouring powder, but because it has milder abrasives, it doesn't scratch like one. Soft scrub cleans even tough soap scum like this, but leaves no sandy grit. Try soft scrub. Cleans like a scouring powder, but doesn't scratch like one. Discover a world of entertainment. Uh-oh. What you got, stranger? Something real sassy. A new song? There's a pepper town. Oh. Think yours can stand up to the great original taste of Dr. Pepper, boy? Yep. This here's new pepper-free. Caffeine-free. Sugar-free, too. Ah. wee Sure is a Dr. Pepper. <laughs> There's always room for another pepper. Meet Deputy Pepper. Introducing Pepper Free. It's caffeine free, sugar free. Another great taste in Dr. Pepper's come to town. We're that neighbor who's always ready to lend a helping hand. We help when disaster strikes. We help when folks need blood. We help the elderly. We help expectant parents prepare for their baby. We help veterans get their benefits. We'll teach you how to check blood pressure. We'll teach you CPR, swimming, and first aid. We're the American Red Cross. We'll help. Will you? All a quiver. What a mess you're making. The neighbors want to know why I'm always shaking just like a flivver. Each morning I get up with the sun. To find at night no work is in the we're talking with Rosemary Clooney, a little older, a lot wiser, and a <laughs> lot happier today, yeah. right? What are your yeah. current projects? Um, I've been doing some concerts with Tony Bennett, and uh, we, we have a show called BBC, Basie Bennett and Clooney, and uh, that was very successful and, and fun. I never worked with Basie before. I did an album with, with Duke and had worked with, with the Ellington a little bit. But I'd never worked with Basie, and there's a joy working with that orchestra that I never experienced before. I still work with, uh, with Four Girls Four, which is a, a wonderful experience for me, because for the first time, I have uh, the camaraderie of having women approximately my age and uh, with the same problems, uh, the same joys. You know, we all have grandchildren, and we have uh, a lot in common. And so it's four old broads on the road together, just <laughs> having That's the great. best time, just That's having great. the best time. That's, That's great. wonderful. Yes. Is there a special man in your life today outside your grandson? Or your yes. Son? <laughs> yes, there is. There was, a, there was a man that I used to go out with before I got married. He was, uh, he was in a picture called Red Garters. Wonderful, wonderful dancer. He was in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, a really, really sensational dancer and singer. And I married somebody else, and so did he. And he lived in Italy for some time. And then about, uh, about seven years ago, I was parked at a stoplight in Beverly Hills. And a man's voice said, Rosella. And nobody had called me that for that many, you know, 20 some odd years. So I knew in those seconds that it took from look to here to look to there. 
that it was him. And I said, oh, my God, I'm so much older. I'm this, I'm that. I have five grown-up children. What is this going to be? And we just looked into each other's eyes, and we've been together ever since. Isn't that neat? Wow, what a nice That's story. That's a fairy story. Isn't that great? Oh, really a nice man. Nice man. Nice story. Yes, you had a question. Was she pleased with the movie that they did about her life? Yeah, I was. I really was. I'd had... Uh, a certain amount to say about the script. Uh, there were some things that couldn't be helped, like the telescoping of time, because it was an hour and a half, or a little more than an hour and a half, of story time. Uh, I chose Sandra Locke because uh, I saw her in a picture when she was about 17 years old, The Heart is the Lonely Hunter, and I thought to myself that she looked like I used to look, and uh, that there was a similarity. And then I met her. She was a friend of, uh, of Merv Griffin's, and that's the way we got together. We met through Merv, and she read the script and wanted to do it. And I was delighted. I like her very much. Is that a tough thing, though, to watch your life being oh, played boy. out? Oh, I mean? boy. If you have a chance, don't do it. <laughs> no, really. No, the, the hard part was not... I was kind of prepared for, uh, for, for the things that happened to me. The thing that was difficult was uh, looking at the relationship between the two girls. That I was not prepared for, and that really moved me. You mean your my the sister, two girls, your sister, and, and yourself? Right. Because the girl who played my sister was terrific too. A, a girl by the name of, of of Penny Milford, Penelope Milford, and she was uh, she was very good. Yes. Um, how long did it take you to recover from your nervous breakdown? I think uh, I think I'm still trying. <laughs> you know, no, I think that it uh, it it is always kind of there. Uh, from the time that I was in the hospital until I started working again was about two and a half years. Um, I was in therapy for eight years, though, and I'm still in group. When I go home on Wednesdays, I go see my, my group, see how things are going. <laughs> so it, think, it takes what, some time. What do you think you learned that, that allows you perhaps to deal differently or prevent yourself from getting into trouble? I think, Sonia, the thing that I learned was that, that, the, the, that there is time for me and that I deserve it, and that, uh, that I can take a week in uh, April, or two weeks in April, and say, I, I don't think I have to work here. There's nothing really that I have to prove. I'd rather stay home. And that's hard for somebody that has worked all their life to do. So it's, uh, it's something I've had to learn, but it does save my life. It does. You had a question. You want to stand, please? Yeah. yeah. Um, being a sex symbol, did it, <laughs> <laughs> did it cause problem in, in raising your children? That's the sweetest thing anyone's ever said to me in my life. But, you know, it's, it's funny. I always thought of myself, and I think some of my friends that were around when I started that are here would agree with me, that I was kind of the girl next door, you know, that kind of... I, I, I don't think that that had any problem. That, that, there was no problem with that at all. My kids, uh, my kids knew that I made records, and they heard music around the house all the time, and... Uh, they just grow up with that, so it's, it's, it's not a, a, a big adjustment, because I, I think I was doing that before they came along, you know? You know? One of the women in the audience didn't want to ask this question. I won't even look in her direction so I don't make her uncomfortable. But coming out of that question, you know, not only are you still attractive, but y you were. You were a beautiful woman with a beautiful figure, and you have a fuller figure now, and a oh, lot well, of women hello. want to... <laughs> You've noticed. <laughs> did, I, did I say that kindly? You said, no, yes, kindly? you did. You were very okay, kind I, I want. Is, is that an issue for you? I mean, does that either cost you something in your career or psychologically, or is it part of coming to terms with, you know, this is kind of who I am, and I'm comfortable with that person? Uh, I'm not particularly comfortable all the time with that person. But I, uh, I realize that I'm 54. I think that it's kind of sad when somebody 54 tries to be the way they were when they were 34 even. I think that coming to terms with it is perhaps what I've done. And, uh, and I feel good about myself. And I'm a singer. I'm a singer. And that has very little to do with anything else. What about your children? We know about Gabrielle. We know they are all gainfully employed, even as I speak. How nice. How nice. This Tell is only this week. Only this week, though. Uh, my, uh, uh, my son, Miguel, is doing a play in Los Angeles. Uh, my daughter, Maria, uh, did a picture for Dina De Laurentiis called Fighting Back, Striking Back, that kind of the vigilante thing that was in Philadelphia. But what she's doing is she's going to be involved in, 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 uh, in a in a wonderful gourmet food store. So she's, she's doing that. 
Uh, my middle son is Gabrielle. He's sculpting and painting every day and taking care of my darling grandchild. Uh, the most my, wonderful child the, in, the, in world. the world. In the world until September. When they'll then we, then we the have other to, most then wonderful. Then the other child. most wonderful. The, uh, my daughter, Mancita, is doing the most wonderful thing. She's kind of the dark horse in the family. She, she was always a good student and everything and kind of dabbled and she did a couple of commercials and stuff like that. But suddenly she's doing a Disney series for the, ca for the Disney cable thing. It's called uh, The Scheme of Things. And she goes off in a helicopter and goes to the bottom of a crater in, uh, in, in Arizona, uh, visits archaeological digs in, in, in Florida. She's doing these fantastically interesting things and commenting on them uh, for the Disney Cable Channel. And I'm just, I'm very proud of her. Well, my cross in life, one more. Oh, is, yes, uh, I forgot. Yes, your cross. My, yes, my cross in life is in Florida doing a play. <laughs> and uh, that's it. That's it. I want to tell you that um, you reminded me of the fact that there was the Betty Clooney show here yes. in, in Detroit. And yes. We just kind of want to welcome you back. I'm sure that just the knowledge, because of how you feel about your sister, that you're here and, and with good memories. We want to thank you for being with us. Thank today. you, Dan. Good luck. Thank you. Appreciate and it. We'll be back with more. Thank you. The way you wear your hat. The way you sip your tea The memory of all that No, no, they can't take that away from me The way you smile Woman's Day presents Different from anyone that I'd ever known in my life I was born in the Midwest and uh, And I don't know, there was a kind of a glamour about A man that had a, a great education and spoke seven languages And was one of the greatest actors in, of our country, I believe now, what do you do when you're in a rising career and you take on married life? Well, uh, you approach it with great hope, uh, some trepidation, I I'm, I'm remember quite well. Um, pretend that everything's going fine, like of course you can run the big house and have the, the great parties and all of that and not know really what you're talking about when you, when you do that, get a lot of advice from friends. Um, the big adjustment uh, came, I think, when I had uh, five children in five years really I had my first my first son was born in uh, February of 1955 and my fifth child in March of 1960 so so uh, yeah it was I'll bet yeah <laughs> sometimes it was like having quince my closest friend was the diaper man <laughs> yeah yeah but it was that and two television series and more hit records what were you superwoman I thought so I thought so and actually that was the 50s myth wasn't it yeah, well, you don't know. That's true. That's yes, too young. Oh, yes, no. I do. <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was, because in the 1950s, everybody picked up the same magazines that I read, you know, and everybody said that you could do everything, that you right. could have a perfect home and a perfect career and perfect children, and, uh, of course, that isn't quite factual. Well, what do you do then? I mean, are you pulled between children and a career? Are you pulled between children, husband, a career, and self? What, what started to happen to you? I think probably the latter. Um, all the uh, all the things pull you at one time or another. Um, the thing that I didn't realize is that you could wake up every morning and decide what the priorities were for that day. I didn't understand that. So that I thought everything was moved first. And so to try to give total concentration to any one of the four, you know, I mean all four at the same time was difficult. You and Jose were um, married not once, but twice. Yes. There was a period yes. of a, a reconciliation, and then... Yes. Actually, why, we were, why we, couldn't you stay together? I mean, can you why speak couldn't to we? that? Yeah. Um, there was so much going for the two of you. Yes, uh, except it's strange, because when we got married, everyone said, what on earth do they have in common? So it's all according to your frame of reference, really. But you told me what you had. Yes. There was a superior yes. human being yes. you saw Yes, yes. But that's not children. what we had in common, is it? Well, but really. This amazing comparison. This broccoli was boiled, this done in the dry cooker, bursting with colors and vitamins. Baked potatoes taste like they've been roasted over a campfire. You can dry roast nuts or prepare a mouth-watering roast. The incredible Swiss dry cooker with exclusive hot air tower gives you all the flavor of crisp frying, but almost none of the fattening oils and calories. Order now on this special TV offer for just $24.95. Money back if not delighted. Use your credit card for rush delivery. Here's how to order. 
Credit card and COD customers call toll-free 1-800-USA-1000. In Georgia, call 1-800-222-7272. To save COD fees, send $24.95 plus $2 postage and handling to Cooker, Box 49648, Atlanta, Georgia. That's Cooker, Box 49648, Atlanta, Georgia. with Rosemary Clooney we talked a little bit about the adventure of life the big rise and then some of the things that started to happen because you found yourself doing what a lot of the women in the 50s you said to take a pill because it was easier than facing a lot of the problems particularly if you couldn't live up to the superwoman image that a lot of us got now people want to ask you some questions so I'm gonna kind of step back and and let them do that because I know how important that sure. is for them yes what happened to your sister my sister died in 1976 it was uh, quite sudden and really out of order because she was 45 and uh, it was a cerebral hemorrhage just very quickly and uh, and I miss her yeah yes what was it like working with Bing Crosby in his movies and what do you think of the book Gary Crosby is bringing out I don't know anything about the book that Gary's bringing out Gary brought over some pages that had to do with my sister because they used to go out together and so those those pages that I was uh, interested in and involved in I okayed for him, and uh, that part of it was just fine. So I don't know about the rest of it. Um, a friend of mine read a review and said that it was like Daddy Dearest. I tend to wonder about that, though, because uh, in the final analysis, you know, he, Bing, was, uh, Bing was a human being. He just had... In the 50s, her face was on the cover of Time magazine. The men in her life were famous, her records were hits, and life was just flying high. And then life took kind of a downward curve. But today, she's flying straight as an arrow and real steady. Let's welcome Rosemary Clooney. It's Hello. great to have you here today. It really is great. And I guess that we here in Detroit always feel a special kind of a feeling about somebody whose background or whose roots are from Detroit. You got started in the, the era of the big bands. I and did, yeah. Yes. Tell us a little bit about what that was like. Uh, my sister and I started with Tony Pastor's band. We had been working at, uh, at WLW in Cincinnati. I was born in Kentucky and lived in Cincinnati most of my life. Um, uh, well, most of my life before I was 16. And then... Uh, we started in radio at WLW, and we had uh, a couple of wonderful years learning how to sing and uh, how to do different kinds of shows. It was great training. And then Tony Pastor came through town and hired us, and for the first time we went out of Ohio and Kentucky and Indiana, and uh, our first job was in, uh, uh, in, at the Steel Pier, and that was a wonderful place to, for bands to play. And there was a great horse that jumped off the back of the pier, you know, with the lady on top of his back. It was really exciting. Uh, we, we traveled with Tony for about three years, and it was, uh, it was great fun, really. Was it being in the right place at the right time? Was it luck? I mean, was it hard oh, work sure. that gets that big break? What well, I think, I think hard work has a great deal to do with it, Sonia, simply because you have to be ready, you know, when, when something does happen. Um, but certainly being in the right place at the right time. And it was a series of... Uh, of circumstances that I didn't foresee at all. I was always happy doing what I happened to be doing at the time. My sister had great ambition, though, and had uh, enough spark for both of us to get started, at least. Oh, that's great. And yeah. then, of course, it was onto the Hollywood circuit, and you, you yeah. met and then married uh, Jose Farrar. Yes. At 16 years your senior, I think, at that particular yes. time. Yes, and even as we speak. And even, <laughs> even now, yes. 16 even years now, you're a senior. senior. <laughs> yes. yes, you had quite an adventure with him. Yes, and, yes. Well, was there something special about that? that seniority that had some appeal do you think oh I think certainly and I think uh, I think he was quite different there were the children yes the indeed family. that's that's the main thing Friends. Uh, it was uh, it was quite difficult his career took him in one direction mine in another um, he really wanted to live in New York I believe because eventually that's where he ended up you know it's so important that you make that point as we speak because sometimes we don't even stop and think 
that there are some wonderful things going for us and they can even take us in even more separate directions than at the moment that we started down. Yes, it's true. It's true. Quite true. Of marriage. But things started to change for you too and apparently yes, not I in think. a very happy direction. Yes. I think a lot of it was chemically induced. I had started taking a lot of pills, different kinds of pills. That was also something that was very big in the 50s. In fact, you know, I, I was reading some, uh, some old scripts that, uh, that I did, some shows with Bing and shows with Bob Hope, and there were big jokes about Milltown, and, uh, and they weren't really Milltown, jokes. Milltown, that's right. Sure. That's right. It wasn't really a joke. Is that something that one does on the road? I mean, is it part of trying to stay up for a show and then come down and go to sleep? Is that the I cycle? Didn't, uh, I didn't have, I didn't take uppers. That wasn't my, my thing. I had, uh, I liked uh, uh, tranquilizers and I loved sleeping pills and uh, sometimes something Why? called Percodan. Why? Why? Yeah, I hear I think Percodan I, all the time. Yeah. People are still doing a lot yeah. of those. Yeah. Well, I think Percodan is, is one of the most addictive drugs that is known. Isn't that but, true? Yeah, but what did you like? I mean, what is it that that was giving you that this great life was? Well, uh, it removes you from the life, obviously, that is not so great. So a lot of what we see is all the outside stuff, the it's veneer. the same stuff that I was reading, too. You yeah, know. the same stuff you were reading. Sure. Was there ever a moment for you, a moment where you made a decision as to whether or not you were going to go on and, and live, whether it was a moment or or you were going to move in one direction or another and you said to yourself, I have to, I have to make a decision about what I'm going to do with my life. Uh, do you mean with, uh, with my illness, with my... Uh... Well, life was, it was not going well. And oh, indeed. But I mean, uh, do you well, mean with you my career? you kind of decided to live. You decided that you were going to try to do something to make your life better? See, I think the thing that I had to do was get away from the, the chemicals because that really, really distorted any kinds of facts that I would feel or any any kind of honest, honest feeling that I would have. So in order to do that, uh, I suppose I had to go to the point that I did, which was uh, almost the end of everything. Well, there yeah. was a, a story that I know that I read that, that had to have been something that stays with you. Something about being, uh, driving on a mountain road. Oh yeah. I was, in, uh, I was in Reno, working in Reno, and I was going to Lake Tahoe. It's, it, it's a, a, a scene that was in the picture that Sandra Locke did about my life, and it was, uh, that was accurate. This thing that, the thing that would probably save me is because there's a new road that goes up to Lake Tahoe from Reno that everybody takes. I was on the old Mount Rose Highway, which is what I remembered, and so I was driving on the wrong side of the road, and uh, I made it, but I think just because a couple of angels were on my shoulder and, uh, and I had other things to do. You know, for so many of us, and as you say, we read the magazines, and that seems to be all that we pay attention to. There is so much that we don't see. When we continue, let's talk a little bit about life and success and the troubles and pulling it together, I okay. think, that people have to do so that we get to see the inside, what we don't often read when we pick up those glossy magazines. We'll do that when we return right after that. <laughs> Now, enjoy delicious fried food without fried food calories. Sound too good to be true? Introducing the incredible Swiss Dry Cooker. A simple, powerful design gives you crisp, deep-fried goodness with just a drop of oil. It seems like an ordinary pan, but look, the secret of the dry cooker is this patented hot air tower. Superheated air rushes up, circulates around food, cooking quickly, evenly. Dry cooking actually bastes food not in fattening grease, but in their own rich flavors and aromas. Yes, more flavor than you've ever tasted before with less oil, fewer calories, less cholesterol. Watch, deep fried chicken cooks because it's surrounded by boiling oil. This batch actually soaked up this much oil. Put chicken in the dry cooker and it's surrounded only by naturally flavored superheated air. With only a drop of oil, turn out crispy, perfect frozen French fries and fish sticks. Bake a cake in a fry pan, never. But watch, the cooker is so dry you can actually bake on the stove top. Superheated convection currents bake evenly, top and bottom. Dry cook hot dogs and they taste like they've been barbecued over a hickory fire, but that's still just the beginning. Dry cook vegetables without boiling or steaming. Look at this.